accelerating learning via knowledge transfer, which just means how to make a computer reuse what we've already taught it. But before I get into that, I'm going to give a little bit of background on what neural nets are, because some of you, it's maybe your first time getting about them. So why are they useful at all? The most common way that most of you have probably interacted with them is with Snapchat filters or other image recognition stuff, where they're used from everything to uh, medical diagnoses. I know the last two journal clubs use them for EEG data. They're used for stock market trading, self-driving cars. Whenever you've got large amounts of data that's difficult to handle, this is probably being used somewhere under the hood to deal with it. So how do they actually work? Does anybody here know how individual neurons work in the brain? How they... <laughs> I mean, I would expect Dr. Kirk to know. <laughs> uh, but does anybody else know uh, how individual neurons work in the brain? Really Noah? Like, where the neurons take stuff from, like, other neurons, and they, like, shoot out, like... Thing. Yeah, so they take in different amounts of electrical uh, signal from different neurons, just like this does, except instead of electric electricity, it's numbers. And different neurons are more important to each individual neuron, so it'll get to multiply them all by a weight. So, you know, one neuron might be, you know, times three, one neuron might be times two. And then, just like a normal neuron, it has a maximum amount of firing, so it passes it through an activation function, to so it can't, you know, fire off 3,000 volts. And a simplified activation function, which we're going to pretend like we're dealing with, is a simple threshold function. So if it receives enough activation, it's just going to fire all the way at one. If it doesn't receive enough, it's not going to fire at all. In real life, there's a little bit of a curve, but this is simpler to talk about. So this is how neurons interact. And just like in the brain, the individual neurons are pretty simple and you can't do much with them. But when you chain them together like this, uh, in complex layers, you have all the input neurons, which take in your data. So you know, if you're dealing with images, that's every pixel. So you'll have hundreds or thousands of these. Then you've got the output. So the output might be what kind of object it is. Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it a car? And then you've got all the hidden layers in between. And that's where the real power is happening. And all of the complexity, all of the power of this neural net is in the structure and the weights, in the connections. None of it's in the actual neuron. Which is why playing around with these, uh, you can do a lot. So this is how a neural net would approximate a simple one-to-one -one function. So if you're taking in how tall someone is and you're spitting out the height, every bump in here is, an, is a neuron, essentially. Right? So in this case, you know, if you're so tall, one neuron fires. If you're even taller, two neurons are firing, and so forth. And unlike real-life neurons, uh, computer neurons can fire negatively, which means you can actually have decreases here. So every extra neuron that you have gives you a little bit more complexity, in approximating your relationship. And every additional layer does something really cool. Because if you're trying to classify input, so if you're trying to say such and such is a dog, such and such is a cat, you might not be able to do it all with one line. So every additional layer allows you to draw more lines to divide up your data. Does this all make sense? Any questions? All right. And so this is what a, neur a neural net is doing underneath the hood. So if this is all your data, you're trying to classify it as blue or orange, right? This is a very complicated function. So you start off on the left with two very simple functions, the x value and the y value, right? So positive or negative, positive or negative. You can see that these three functions are more complex, right? They have diagonals. And the final neuron is combining the three previous neurons. So, you know, that one over there represents this boundary. The second one is representing this boundary. And the third one is representing this boundary. So every additional layer, you can combine and get more complex approximations of your data. So finally, my, my researchers were two researchers at Google who wanted to learn how to develop neural nets faster. <coughs> now, because, like I said, all the power, all the complexity is in the structure, right? You often start with multiple simple structures for, for your whatever your problem is and see which one works best. Then. You take that structure, you make a bigger, more complicated version of it to actually solve the problem. Except instead of doing this in two steps, they're going to repeat this process 10, 20 times so they get an ideal structure for the, by the time they're actually using it to solve the problem. The problem is this is very wasteful because every time you make the model bigger, you have to start training it from scratch. 
Whereas for humans, you know, when we're kids, our brains are constantly growing. It's not like every time we add an extra neuron or, or you know, grow an extra, an extra, an extra tissue layer, we don't throw away everything we've already learned. We can just keep on learning, keep on refining. So that's what they wanted to do for computers. So they found two ways of doing this. The first one was to widen an existing layer. So they said, what if we duplicate a neuron exactly? The problem is then that neuron is effectively more important, and you're going to warp uh, how it sees the data. So what they did was actually really elegant. They, they said all the neurons that took an input from the original neuron tell that each of the duplicate neurons is exactly half as important as the, as the old neuron was. And that way, they can have a bigger, more complicated neural net, which they can continue training right, and continue refining without damaging all the learning they've already done, which is significantly better than the old model where they would have had to start from scratch. But what's more powerful is that they found a way to deepen neural nets. So they have something called an identity mapping, which is essentially that they want a layer in between that does absolutely nothing. Right? This is actually more complicated than you would think because if you remember, you're not just adding the inputs together and spitting it out. You have to pass it through that activation function so you don't have neurons going crazy. So depending on the activation function, you have to essentially factor the layer differently, and that changes for every activation function. But they can do it for, they, they, they have math that shows it can be done for every common activation function that's used. And by having an identity layer, again, they haven't damaged any of the learning, they're just passing it through. So it takes in the three inputs and spits them out exactly. Right? And then again, you can start training. And in this way, they can go through the process. They can take an existing neural net, an existing model, make it more complex, make it bigger, and not have to start from scratch. So now it, it'll get a little bit more dense here, hopefully not too dense. <laughs> so there, there's a concept in neural nets called, uh, yes? Um, before you go really complicated, I have a question for two slides ago. Um, you said that it like, modifies the significance of the duplicate, but does it also modify the significance of the first one? Like you said it was half the significance, so is it half the other one? So you can see over here that H2 mm -hmm. is the original neuron. So H, the H2 and H3, they take in the exact same inputs from the previous layer, right? So A and C, and then A and C, and A and C. Mm -hmm. But the Y neuron, which takes them both in, right? Initially, it took just, it said H of 2 was, say, three times as important as H of 1 plus. But now it's saying H of 2 is 1.5 times important, mm -hmm. and H of 3 is 1.5 times as important. Because of just adding them together, mm -hmm. these two are equivalent, mm -hmm. but this one is bigger, which means once you start training it, it can become more complex and more refined. Gotcha. So what happens to the one on the left? The one on the left you don't use anymore. That's the old model. Okay. You're transitioning over to the new model, which is more complex and larger. Yeah. So there's this idea called a training set and a test set. So. The training set is like if you're teaching a toddler how to recognize a cat, you might show it 100 pictures of a cat, and 100 pictures of different cats, and that would be the training set. The test set is meant to simulate the real world. So if you go out and ask it to actually recognize cats walking around on the sidewalk, then that's the test set. Now, training set accuracies and test set accuracies are different, because obviously the toddler is going to be better at recognizing images that you've actually shown it. Right? So this shows, so that the big blue dotted line is the maximum accuracy achieved of the old system, of just making it bigger, right? And you can see that it's pretty decent. It improves down from 70% to 95% if you make it bigger. You can see that A, their system, either uh, red is making it wider, and uh, the black one is making it deeper, adding an extra layer, uh, not only converges on its maximum accuracy much, much faster, but it's actually able to achieve higher accuracies. And I'll be talking about why that is in a little bit. But what's even more interesting is that the same thing holds for real world data. So it's able to A, converge much, much faster, and it's able to, especially uh, the, net, the deeper net where they add an extra layer, it's able to get almost a full percent higher worth of accuracy, which given the models that they're using and given the scale that they're working on is immense. Yes. So in the deeper net, are they adding the identity layer? Like yes. You were saying? That's what that does. Okay. And then they're going to start training it again. Okay. So there's something in neural nets. Sorry. 
What kind of data are they training? So I'm just out of curiosity. So uh, this, they were they were basing their neural nets, the neural nets they were playing around with, on uh, Google's inception model. Uh, Google's inception model is a large general purpose image recognition neural net. So you can pass almost any image into it and it'll identify it. So yeah, this is image recognition data. Which is which is actually why 1% is especially significant because the inception net is has hundreds of thousands of layers. They're actually not adding one, they're adding many. Uh, but squeezing 1% out of it, out of something so complex is immensely important to do so. Otherwise, it would require like supercomputer level amounts of power. So there's something which is the bane of neural net design, it's called overfitting, right? And the idea is that if you have a training set, right, there are naturally going to be some quirks in it, but have to be, no matter how large you can make the training set. So let's say you know all your cats had their tails up. Now, if your neural net is complex enough, your neural net is going to pick up, pick that up, and it's going to say a tail being up means it's probably a cat. This is bad because it means that once you take it into the real world, it's going to damage its accuracy. Now, there are all sorts of very complicated methods of dealing with overfitting. Their method actually helps to alleviate it in a much simpler way than most other methods that currently prevent this issue, which is that if you force it to start with a simple model, it has to start with a robust, simple model of the problem. If you expand it and start refining it, you're refining the existing model, not building a model from scratch, right? And that means that uh, it can't overfit. It doesn't have the ability to pick up on small, minute details. By starting simple and then expanding it, you're forcing it to only pick up on the big, important things, which is why you can get these higher accuracies in the real world and the higher accuracies in testing, because once you start overfitting, it's, you get pushed into a trap, basically where it starts focusing more and more on minute details. Any questions? Anish? Can you combine and plug at the same time? Can you deepen a, ne a neural net and widen it at the same time? You can, it would just be in two steps. Oh. But you don't have to train in between. So I'm kind of confused because you said how deepening a neural net with like the identity um, layer doesn't like do anything because like that layer you said that does absolutely nothing. So how does it make it more accurate or efficient if its functionality is like not necessarily? So from when you first deepen it, yeah. it hasn't done anything. But the way neural net training works is you look at every connection and say if I strengthen this connection, would it make it more accurate? <coughs> if I weaken this connection, would I make it more would it make it more accurate? Okay. So if you have more connections, which you are introducing, okay. once you start training. It can look at each connection and has more connections to work with and create a more more accurate, more complex uh, approximation of the problem. So it kind of like refine the weights because it has more like connections to the original connection to like do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions? All right. In that case, I would like to give a big thank you to the Journal Club team for helping me work through all of this. A big thanks for my family for being here. Thank you, Mr. Burkhardt, for listening to, I think, every version of this presentation in some form or another. And uh, thank you to everybody for being here.